Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we welcome you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. And you just listening out in the radio listening audience, most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping today we can be an inspiration to everyone. I spoke last Sunday on this subject, Where is my wandering boy tonight? Has to do with the prodigal son. I only got about half of the message, and today I'm going to bring the remainder of it. Where is my wandering boy tonight, number two? So this message today and the one last Sunday will go together. Messages number one, messages, uh, message number one, and message number two. And you in the radio listening audience, if you'd like to have these messages, if you'd like to have the cassette tape on today's uh, broadcast or last Sunday or any Sunday morning, we have them available. And if you don't have the beautiful calendar we're sending out this year, you should write in and get your calendar. Just say, Preacher Edward, send me the calendar. Be glad to do so. If you'd like to have the cassette tape, if you write in and close the gift to take care of the expense and so forth and request the tape, we'll get it in the mail to you. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Now, the gift that you send in for the tape is used to pay for our radio time. And we appreciate your support. We appreciate your prayers as we endeavor to get out the Word of God during the closing days of this marvelous grace age. Now, take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 15. I'm reading today from page 1097 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I do have about three, I believe, or uh, maybe four of the Bibles still left on hand, the Schofield Reference Bibles, if you're interested. I can uh, let you have them uh, for savings. And I uh, only have about three or four. And after they're gone, I won't have any more this year. That's the original Schofield Reference Bible. I prefer that. I've, I've used it from the time God saved me. And I bought my first Schofield Bible. It's always been a help to me. And uh, the Schofield, the original Schofield Reference Bible has been very helpful to ministers and teachers and so forth. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's other good Bibles like the Thompson Chains Reference Bible. But I prefer the Schofield Reference Bible, the old Schofield, not the new. I don't go for people tampering with the Word of God, trying to bring it up to date and trying to modernize and streamline the Bible. I don't believe in that. I believe you need to stick by the old King James Version. I've never seen any group yet, I don't care how fundamental they claim to be, that tried to do a better translation of what they didn't foul up someplace. Now God has used the King James Version to produce revivals, to save nations, to save multitudes. And God has honored it now for many years. And why change now? I, I wouldn't have one of these liberal modern translations I don't them around me I wouldn't have one of them to preach from or try to teach from you need to stick with the old King James Version Bible whether it be the Schofield reference or some other King James Version as long as the King James Version you, you never have a better translation God gave it to us and through great Bible scholars Greek scholars Hebrew scholars Latin scholars English scholars they did the translating and they did a good job. And I'm not going to accept any improvement by some of these liberal uh, so-called uh, smart translators today that think they bring in the Word of God up to date. The Word of God's always been up to date and ahead of date. Tells you what's going to happen in the future and so forth. Now Luke chapter 15. Now last Sunday I read verses 1 through 24. But in order to conserve time, I'll just read verses 11 to 24 today and bring message number two on the subject, Where is my wandering boy tonight? Now, since it's morning time, you might say, Where is my wandering boy this morning? As I said on last Sunday, a lot of people know where the dog is. They know where the pig is, the cow, the horse, and old Tom the cat, but they don't know where the young'uns are. That's a sad situation. 
And Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the young of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with his living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. He began to be in want and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many a high... Verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto his father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight. And no more words to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring him the fatted calf and kill him and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now here you have a parable in three parts. In fact, you can say four parts if you want to include the elder brother beginning with verse 25 through 32. And Jesus here is giving this parable. And the reason for giving the parable is because the scribes and the Pharisees and that religious crowd criticized him because he ate with publicans and sinners. And when he would sit down and eat with them, uh, these old Pharisees would come around and say, well, you see, he's, he's not what he's cracked up to be or he wouldn't be eating with publicans and sinners. While Jesus ate with them, he did not engage in their sinful acts, to be sure, but he associated in their presence in order that he might win them to himself. Now you can't win a sinner to God unless you go where he, where he is. You don't have to engage in what he's doing. But you must be where he is in order to reach him for God. Or get him under the influence of the gospel. And he was criticized because he was associating with sinners. And telling them about the eternal life of God. And how they could be saved and so forth. Now here you have the trinity at work. You have... The shepherd going after the sheep. You have the woman sweeping for the corn. And you have the father receiving the son home. There you have the trinity engaged in this act of finding something or seeking something or receiving something. And this has to do with a lost sinner. Now as I said on last Sunday, oftentimes we use the scripture to preach to backsliders. And use the prodigal son as an example that does for good preaching, all right, but it's really not the real meaning of it. Jesus didn't give it for that purpose. Jesus gave it to show the picture of the lost sinner coming to God. Now the boy left home, and that points us back to the time that when God created man, then man left God, and when he gets saved, he comes back home to God. Now we all sinned in Adam. We left God. We wanted away from God in Adam. And the way we get back to the Father's house is through faith in Jesus Christ. And then we get back into fellowship with God. We're gods by creation, but not gods by birth or adoption until you come to know Him as your Savior. Now you need to keep that in mind. That's what he's talking about here. And we saw where the son leaves home and he goes into a faraway country. And he spends all of his money in routish living. And he had a great number of friends. As long as he was well fixed and had money to spend, he didn't know he did have so many friends. And then after he spent all of his money, he come to find out he didn't have any friends. Young man said to me one time, he said, Preacher Edwards, I bought me a new automobile, had a little spending money. Boy, I had it made. I didn't know I had so many friends, boys and girls. I just had friends. They'd come around and I'd see them. I was most welcome. But he said, you know what happened? He said, I wrecked my car and got in jail. And said, I come to find out I didn't have any friends. So that crowd that ran with him, as long as he had a beautiful automobile and spending money and showing them a good time, they were his friends. But whenever he spent his money and wrecked his car and got into trouble, ended up in jail, they didn't know him. Now, a friend indeed is a friend when you're in need. 
And a friend will stick to you at all times. I'm talking about a real, genuine friend. And so you need to realize that this boy thought he had some friends, but when he spent all of his money, had no food to eat, no doubt he worn out his shoes, clothes ragged. He tried to find a job and landed a job feeding hogs there to hog pen. Now that was some job for a Jewish lad, but that's what he did. He fed hogs. He joined, no doubt, a Gentile in the faraway country. And then began to feed the swine. Now I want us to take up from there and find out what happened. We know that swine in the Bible is symbolic of apostatized uh, Christendom. And so religion is not what people need. They need salvation. Now I want you to notice in verse 17. The Bible says after he had spent all. After he landed there in this far away country. Had no job, no money, no food. Clothes worn out, tired and weary. The Bible said then after he was assigned to feeding swine, the only food he had was the same food the hogs ate. And then after all of this, the Bible says he, a mighty famine hit the land. Seemed like many times when trouble comes, it comes in bunches like bananas. And that's what happened here. A mighty famine hit the land. He's in a faraway country. No man would help him. And the word of God said he came to himself. Now, Jesus is illustrating here why and how sinners are saved. Now, I want to drive this home to you today. No sinner is coming to God until he sees his need. Now, in the past few years, many churches have been filled with gimmicks and high pressureism and various other things to get in members, to count numbers, to count noses, and have filled up a lot of churches with unsaved church members. And today they're suffering from it. Now you might get unsaved church members in your church for a while, but they won't be there long. When you begin to really lay out the word of God and really preach it like it is to people like they are, many of these unsaved church members are not going to be able to take it. They will eventually find some kind of excuse and ease on out. They'll try to find something to get mad about or find something against the preacher or something against someone in the church. They'll find some kind of excuse because they don't like the pressure and they want to get out from under the pressure. Goats never did like to be around sheep too much and they're not going to stay there very long. And a lot of these churches today that's gone through a lot of high pressure movements in days gone by, got people in by giving them hot dogs and entertaining them, haven't been able to hold them. And while they had them there, they went into debt and built large buildings and going to do great wonders. And then when that bunch of goats got tied together with the sheep and they quit coming and, and then the finances of course dropped and left them in trouble. And churches all over this country have got into financial trouble because they borrowed money and built expensive buildings when they had a lot of people in the entertaining them and a lot of unsaved people in the audiences. And when the unsaved began to slip out and left them there with that turbo budget and it couldn't meet that and and it caused great uh, disgrace and reproach upon the cause of God. And left people stranded. And then a lot of the uh, businessmen and people that knew God in the church saw what was happening. And they wanted to get out from under the load. And they eased on out. And left the poor preacher and some of his members there to pay the terrible debt they had upon them. Now all of that is brought about because they wanted to do, build a big church and get a big name for themselves. And count noses and use gimmicks and high pressure movements. And got sinners in that didn't know God. Now listen to me. A sinner will never be saved until he's shown his lost condition. He's got to come to himself and realize he's lost. Realize he's on the road to hell. Realize he needs a savior. And when he gets in that predicament then you might get him to God. And when you get a person like that to God you have a genuine convert. You won't have to go out and pump them up and drag them into church every Sunday. They'll come. They love the Lord. Because they got something on the inside of them that makes them want to be there. And they're genuine converts. Now this boy came to himself and he began to think about the bread back in the father's house. Now Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And he didn't want to think about that. He did something about it in verse 20. He arose and came to his father. Now, whenever a sinner wants to be saved, he just can't sit there and do nothing about it. He's got to be willing then to repent and accept Christ. And when he does that, God will do something for him. 
The Bible said he arose and came to his father. And then he had in mind, he said, I'm going back to my father in verse 19. I will go and ask him to let me be a hired servant. Let me just come back home and not be a son, but just a hired servant and work out in the field and among the sheep and like one of the servants. Now what he had in mind was going back and working to be able to stay there. Now that's a picture of people today that work to be saved and work to keep saved. Now if you're saved by works, you have to work to stay saved. Really, you're not saved, but some people think you are. Some people treat salvation like a man riding a bicycle. Unless you just keep on pedaling, the thing will turn over with you. And they say, i got to keep doing some things or I won't make it to heaven. And they try to keep up with good deeds and good works. But that's not the way in. Now this boy had that in mind. He said, I'm going back and be one of the old hired servants. I want to do some work around there in order that I might be able to remain there in my father's house. But he was thinking about that all the way in. And you have sinners like that. You have a lot of times sinners that say, well, I want to get saved, but i got to think about now what to do, and I'll have to do this and do other things. And, and they begin to think about that, and then they come forward to get saved. And when they get down to the altar to be saved, they forget about all these things and the big spill they were going to give, and they just say, God, here I am. Save me. I'm going to hell. That's all they need to realize. Save me, Father. I'm going to hell and repent and believe on Jesus Christ and forget about all the little speech and things you intended to do and say when you got down to the altar. Now he's on the way back home and he receives a hearty welcome when he arrives back. Now there's exactly five things his father did toward him when he came home and five is the number of grace. And by grace through faith are you saved that not of yourself is a gift of God. Now notice five things the father did. Number one, while he was a great way off, the father saw him in verse 20. He was a great way off. The father saw him. Now God sees all sinners today. He may be a great way off, but God sees him. Then number two, he had compassion on him in verse 20. The father had compassion on this wayward boy. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5, God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. It's God that has compassion on the sinner. And notice number three, the father ran to meet him. Now this is the only place in the Bible that you can find where God ever got in a hurry. God doesn't need to get in a hurry because he has forever to do what he wants to do in, but here... We find God in a hurry, and this is only in a type. This father is a type of God, and he runs to meet that boy coming home. If there's ever a time when God would get in a hurry, it would be when a sinner wants to be saved. God wants him to be saved far more than the sinner wants to be saved. Then number four, we find here that he fell on his neck and embraced him. They put his arms around him, hugged that boy to his bosom, embraced him because he had compassion on him. And that's exactly what the Father will do for every sinner that wants to be saved. God will embrace him as it were. God will say, now cast your burden upon me. Come to me, all you meek and lowly and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And so he fell on his neck and embraced him. And then number five, he kissed him. And this is, of course, love we see here from the Father toward the Son, the kiss of love. And so the boy is received back home, and the Father did something for him here in five different ways. And God will do this for every sinner that wants to be saved. Then we move on to number six, and that is the prodigal's response. Now notice what he did. I showed you what the Father did, but notice what he did. In verse 21... And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. Now no more worthy to be called thy son. Now he said nothing here about being a hide servant. Remember when he started back home, he said, I'm going back to my father. Now I say to my father, just make me one of the old hide servants here on the farm. But now when he feels the father's love and his father's reception, he doesn't say one word about uh, being a servant there on the farm, a hide servant. 
He said, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. He said, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Now, every sinner should take that attitude when he comes to God. If someone should come forward, kneel at the altar and say, well, now, Lord, I'm kind of bad, not as bad as others. I got some good things about me, some pretty good characteristics about me others might not have. He might as well go on back to seat. God's not going to save him. The only way in the world God will save any sinner is for that sinner to realize he's lost. He's on the road to hell. He should have been in hell a long time ago. He doesn't deserve God. He doesn't deserve heaven. He's a lost, wretched, hell-bound sinner. And when he realized that, there's no good in him. He cannot buy his way to heaven. He cannot work his way to heaven. There's none good, no, not one, said the Bible. And he takes his place in the dust before God and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Then God will have mercy on him. A lot of our churches, they are filled up with religious Pharisees and people that thought they were good enough to go to heaven without repentance, without getting saved. And you have a bunch of religious people without God on the road to torment. And that's pathetic. Now he fell down before God. He felt very sinful. And he was very sinful. He said nothing about being a height servant. And he's accepted by the Father. Now when he's accepted by the Father, there are several things the Father had done for him. I want to point out to you. Number one, the Father said, go bring the best robe and put it on him. Verse 22, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. He didn't say, I want you to go get that old worn out robe. He didn't say, I want you to go get a robe that some of the other boys had worn. They had a nice robe there in the wardrobe. And he said, now you go and get that best robe and bring it and put it on this boy. Now this old boy was ragged, no doubt barefooted, his clothes torn and been in the hog pen. And, and uh, the father said, now you go bring the best robe and put it on him. And the best robe was brought and the Bible said it was put on the boy. He didn't put it on himself. The father didn't say, now here, take this robe and slip into it. No, sir. The Bible said it was put on him. That's exactly what God does for our sinner. When you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, God clothes you in his robe of righteousness. God puts the wedding garment on you. God clothes you in his robe of righteousness. Now you remember God clothed Adam and Eve when they sin in the garden. God came in the garden the cool of the day and discovered Adam and Eve. They had sinned against him and they were naked and they tried to hide behind fig leaves. And God just went out and killed an animal and took the skins of that animal and made them some clothes. He clothed them in the skins of animals. Now that's a type of being clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the blood of those animals is a type of the blood of Christ that he shed on Calvary. And so he put the robe on him, which is a type of God's robe of righteousness. Now he didn't stop there. The Bible says in verse 22, he put a ring on his finger. A ring on his finger. Now a ring in the Bible speaks of a seal. The Bible said we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Now when God saves that sinner, God seals him with a seal from heaven. Now the robe of righteousness is put on the sinner, which is God's righteousness. The Holy Ghost is the seal. He comes in him to dwell and he's sealed until the day of redemption. It speaks of being sealed. It's a symbol of never ending love. Now you people sitting here in this auditorium and you out in the radio listening audience, if you have a wedding band, if you notice that wedding band has no end, that's a symbol of your never ending love toward your companion. It has no end. So he said, put a ring on his finger, which is symbolic of never ending love toward God. When God seals you with the Holy Spirit of promise, you should love God forever. Not only that, it speaks of ownership. Now this boy belongs to his father. He's owned by his father and God owns you and you belong to God when you're saved and sealed. Just like the woman there that wears your wedding band you placed on her finger, she belongs to you. When you put that wedding band on her finger and the preacher, of course, when he finished with the ceremony, that woman belongs to you and that ring signifies thusly that she is your property. She belongs to you. 
And that ring is symbol of your never ending love. Not only that, it, it's, marked, it's a mark of high honor and esteem. Now when Pharaoh in the land of Egypt promoted Joseph to be prime minister, the Bible said Pharaoh put a ring upon Joseph's finger. And he said, Joseph, you're prime minister here. And everything you say goes. Whatever you say, that's it. I'm only higher than you on the throne. That's all. You run this country. And he put that ring on his finger. And that spoke of esteem and high honor. Genesis 41, 42. And then the ring is put on the hand. And the hand speaks of labor. The ring is emblem of the Holy Spirit. And we must labor for God in the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit seals us. Then we labor for God in the spirit. When you put that ring on your wife's finger, then she becomes your helpmate to labor with you upon this earth. And then not only did he put a ring on his finger, but he put some shoes on his feet. Now shoes, of course, speak of service. In those days, the sons wore shoes. The slaves went barefooted. And so they put some shoes on him. He came in from the faraway country. No doubt he came back barefooted and he put some shoes on his feet. And that means a provision for daily walk. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11, And thus shall you eat it with shoes on your feet. Get busy, move for God. When God saves you, he puts shoes on your feet. That is, God puts the holy shoes on your feet to serve him. God wants your feet and your hands to serve him. The Bible says in Mark chapter 6 and verse 9, Be shod with sandals, the Bible tells us. Get ready for service. God intends you to sit around on the stool of do nothing, saying, I shall not be moved. You got some feet. God wants you to use them to his glory. Not only did he put shoes on his feet, but he had something else done for him. And that is he had the fatted calf killed in verse 23. The father said to his servants, Go out here. And get the fatted calf out there. Don't go get old poor John. Go out and get that fatted calf. Uh, we get some good steak out of that fatted calf. And kill it right quick and dress it. We're going to cook up some steaks around here. This boy is hungry. He's been down at the hog pen. Eating a hus of swine to eat. And, and we're going to have some good old grilled steaks around here. And get her ready boys. And those servants went out and got that fatted calf. And they killed it. They dressed it. They came in and they fixed up some good old steaks and they set the table and they began to eat and be merry and shout the victory and praise God. The father had killed the fatted calf for the boy. Every time a sinner gets saved and God puts his shoes on him and a ring on him and a robe on him, God says, all right, you get busy and now the fatted calf is for you and you come to the house of God and feed upon the fatted calf, feed upon the word of God. Feed upon the blessings of God because I want you to do so. And that's why you're here today. You come here to feed from the fatted calf from God's table and eat the good fatted calf. You have communion at the table with the Father. The fruit of communion is joy. And the Father finds delight with his children. So God is pleased, well pleased when you're happy, when you're joyful, when you're delightful, when you come to the house of God with a smile on your face. And say, I'm glad to be here. Praise the Lord. A lot of people come in with a frown on their face. A face long enough to drink milk out of the bottom of a churn. Now God wants you to come with a smile on your face. A spring in your heel. A gleam in your eye. Come in praising God. And come in willing and wanting to eat the fatted calf. And enjoy the blessings of God. Don't come in like you thought your mom in law was going home with you and stay six months. Come in like everything is wonderful and every day is Christmas and you're just going to enjoy the blessings of God. That's the way God wants it to be. And it should be that way. Dwight L. Moody used to preach a lot on the prodigal son. And Dwight L. Moody had a brother just got up and left home one day and didn't come back. And every day and on special occasions on his birthday at Christmas time, his mother would always put a chair out there for him and put a plate out there for him. And she prayed every day that her boy would soon come back home. But she didn't see him. She prayed. She didn't give up. She kept setting the plate out on his birthday. A special plate at Christmas time. Then one day Dwight L. Moody and his mother's out putting up some pigs and hogs that got out of the fence. And they'd run those hogs down. And had them all just about inside the fence. And lo and behold they saw a tramp coming down the road. 
Now Dwight didn't recognize him immediately, but that mother of his did. She grabbed up that long apron that reached down to the ground and grabbed that bonnet, hogs or no hogs, let him go back out in the field. That's my boy coming home. And she ran down the road and she met her boy, dirty, filthy, long hair, long beard. There she threw her arms around him and began to weep. She said, son, I knew it. I knew you'd come back home. He said, mom, I'm so glad to get back. I'm sorry I left. I'm so glad to get back home. So Dwight had to go out and round the hogs up again. His mother forgot about them hogs. That boy had gotten there. Now, beloved, whenever a sinner comes to God, God welcomes him in and he becomes part of the family of God and should be recognized, honored, and loved by God's people as part of the family of God. If you're not saved today, you ought to get in the family. You may be like the prodigal son out there lost without God. You need to get in today because you don't know how soon God may call. You don't know when the Lord may come and pay you to be ready when God does call or when he comes back again. Let us stand to our feet. You've listened well today and I appreciate it very much. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll take the message and use it. Not only, dear God, here in this auditorium, but use the message out in the vast radio listen audience. May some prodigal son come home today as a result of this radio ministry, reaching out in the field out there where we can't see. And God speak to people here in the auditorium. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, while Debbie plays for us, if you're here today and you need to come to God and you want to join the church, or for any reason, that you want to come forward or would you come while she plays a couple of stanzas? How about it? I'm coming home, would you come? Church, come back to God, get saved, would you come while we wait?